Yes, we're going to start. It's about uh, 5 p.m. now or 5 past two already. Um, welcome to today's SONAS webinar series. This is a joint initiative between the Society of Neuroscientists of Africa, Trend in Africa, and the African Society of Neurologists. Uh, I am Karen Gemini. I am a member of the Society of Neuroscientists of Africa and I'm also part of uh, the coordination team of this webinar series. So as you probably know, with uh, this initiative, we really hope uh, to showcase rising stars in neuroscience like our guests today. And we also want to inspire a new generation of African neuroscientists as well as hopefully helping to create some kind of uh, mentorship opportunity. So this webinar is meant to be interactive Please feel free to use the, the chat box at any time during the, the talk to ask your questions and uh, uh, Dr. Mafos will be answering those questions at the end of his presentation. So like I just said, I said earlier, rising star in neuroscience and <laughs> today I am really pleased to host Dr. Ahmed uh, Mafuz. Uh, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Human Genetics at Leiden University Medical Center, that's in Holland, Netherlands, if I can say it that way. He's also a member of the Leiden Computational Biologist Center and an affiliated faculty member of the Delft Bioinformatics Lab at Delft. So uh, Delft University of Technology, that's the university where he received um, if you uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that's where you receive your PhD, right? From the oh, Delft right. University of Technology. But before that, um, Dr. Mafuz studied in Egypt, so in Africa, so an African fellow here with us today. He received his bachelor and his master in communication and information technology from Neil University in Egypt. Um, so if I ask the question, which brain cells does what uh, when a pathology like Parkinson's disease arise? Uh, I would say this is an interesting question. And this is the type of questions that uh, Dr. Mafos is trying to answer with his work, where he combines um, well, the biological knowledge, the background that he obtained uh, at the Leiden uh, Institute, uh, with algorithm from his former university where he was doing mainly computational science. So he used the functional characterization of variants through highly sophisticated transcriptomics data analyzers, for example, by relying on brain transcriptome uh, atlas, such as Allen brain atlas to infer functional relations between genes and trying to integrate uh, those uh, results uh, within with neuroimaging in order to better understand neuropathology. So with this work, he identified some key genes and pathways that are associated uh, with brain disorders. So I'm really excited. I am very curious about this talk and I am sure all our audience now is really eager to hear more about your work on single cell analysis, modeling, and so on. Uh, like I said, interactive seminar and we're all here. So I'll turn the audience to you now, um, the attention to you now, Dr. Mafos. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice and generous <laughs> introduction. Um, yeah. I'm going to share my screen and um, yeah. Just confirm it that you can you can see my. So uh, I can slide. see your screen. Yeah. All screen. right. <laughs> Perfect. So thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I'm really glad to be to be here uh, with you today, and uh, I hope that uh, yeah you would find this talk uh, also useful. Um, so I I had already prepared the short introduction about myself, but I don't think it's it's really necessary. So indeed, I studied engineering at Cairo University, and then I did my masters in uh, communication information technology at Nile University. Um, in Egypt, of course, and then I, I, I moved to the Netherlands to pursue my PhD. So I did my PhD in bioinformatics at the TU Delft, um, and then I moved 20 minutes away to Leiden, where I um, did a short postdoc, and now I um, joined as an assistant professor at the human genetics department. Um, 
So what do we do actually? So we, we are interested in general in, in relations between uh, genetics and environmental factors as well to phenotypes. So over the past couple of decades, uh, genome-wide association studies have been used to identify genetic variants that are uh, associated with brain disorders. Um, and the cartoon I show here is kind of a representation of this situation where you, you read in the news that we've identified, I don't know, 100 genes or, or SNPs that are associated with schizophrenia, for instance. And, and that's really nice and really great. And this amount of data is already giving us uh, very good insights. But the problem comes with the fact that for most of the brain disorders, these are complex diseases. Um, that means that you don't have one genetic uh, variant or genetic factor that results in the disease, but rather you have a, a, a large set of variants that together give rise to uh, the disorder. And of course, to study these variants, it's very difficult for neurobiologists to take one of these variants that are identified in, in, in genome-wide association studies um, and, and let's say create a mouse model for that because it's very unlikely that this mouse model will have a phenotype because the effect size is so small. Yeah. So we, we have this, this problem that, yeah, geneticists are in general generating a lot of variants and identifying a lot of variants. And on the other hand, the, the, the interpretation of these variants is very, very difficult uh, in terms of their function. So the approach we take is, is to basically say, okay, we, we, we want to bridge this gap using transcriptomic data. So we, we would like to look at gene expression um, and through that, try to understand how these many variants of, of, uh, um, of brain disorders relate to each other, for instance, or how do they relate to brain function? Um, and for that, we make use of these transcript transcriptome atlases. So um, atlases in which we have a large amount of measurements um, um, of every gene, every transcript across different brain regions and across different development stages. Um, and the largest resources that are out there uh, of this type are coming from the Allen Institute for Brain Sciences, which is uh, um, a research institute in Seattle in, in, in the United States. Um, and what they have been doing for, for many, many years now, um, I think they started in 2003, is, is they started by building these atlases of gene expression across the brain. First, it was the mouse brain. Um, and the way to do this is that you take the mouse brain, you cut sections, and you stain these sections uh, using in situ hybridization for the expression of one gene. And then you collect these sections back in a 3D volume. Um, and, and of course, this is uh, coupled with very detailed anatomical annotation of different brain regions. Um, and, and the similar approach has been used in, in, in human data. I'll explain that a bit later in, in details. Um, and what this data allows us to do is to basically First of all, you can look at spatiotemporal patterns. So, so if you have a gene of interest that is implicated either in a specific disease or a function that you're interested in, you can just check where is this gene expressed in the brain. And, and as basic as this information might seem, um, before these atlases, getting this information was actually very, very costly, right? You would need to set up an experiment where you would collect all these samples yourself and then measure the expression to end up only with a, probably a handful or a very, very few locations where this gene is relevant, right? Uh, so I think th these resources are, are, are highly invaluable, but you can also do things that are a little bit more complex, right? So you can, for instance, try to use these sort of embeddings. So the, each, each dot here is a sample from the human brain and, and it's colored ba based on the anatomical region where it comes from. And then you can try to look into relations between uh, brain samples or different locations in the brain in terms of their transcriptional similarity, right? Um, you can turn the problem around and look at similarities between different genes. So how similar are two genes in terms of their expression pattern across the brain or across, uh, across different development stages? Uh, and this can tell you something about their functional relationship. So if two genes are always up or down together, this can tell you something that they are perhaps involved in the same pathway or the same function. Um, and, and, and I will not, I will talk about this uh, a bit later. You can also look at data integration. So for instance, we we here have data on the RNA expression of genes, so how active or inactive genes are. Um, but we can also have data in terms of chromatin structures uh, in the brain. So how uh, in, inside the nucleus, how the DNA is actually uh, wrapped uh, and how does this in, uh, at the end relate to expression patterns. Yeah. Um, so today I want to show you one example of, of how we make use of these atlases and that's in the context of Parkinson's disease. So. Uh, um, 
as a very short introduction, Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder. Um, the, it, it, it's a progressive disorder, so it starts with um, symptoms like loss of smell or, or um, facial uh, tremors. Um, and then you get to the uh, hallmark of the disease, what pe people probably uh, notice is uh, uh, general tremors or rigidity. Um, and, and very later stage, much later stages of the disease can also result in cognitive impairment or dementia-like uh, symptoms. Um, and, and these, these clinical manifestations of the disease are ma um, matched by um, pathological patterns uh, that are defined by uh, BRAC into different stages. So in the symptomatic, uh, symptomatic uh, stage, we are mainly talking about BRAC stage one and two, uh, in which you basically find uh, neuropathologies in the, in the brain stem, right? And as the disease progresses, you get into BRAC stages three and four, and then the, the pathology starts to spread to different parts of the, uh, of the brain. At this stage is when you actually detect these motor symptoms. Um, and at later stages here, you see that these pathologies are, um, um, have spread it to the cortex, and that's the stage in, in, at which you get cognitive impairments as well. Um, so the question we wanted to answer in this study is, can we actually identify brain region specific patterns of expression that are related to this pattern of pathology spread, right? So we know that the pathology first appears in, uh, in the brain stem and then it keeps spreading until it reaches the cortex. So are there, are there genes in the, in the human brain that show this pattern as in they either have high expression in areas that are affected earlier. So this is indicated by region one, R1 here and have low expression at later stages or the other way around. They have low expression at early stages, higher expression at later stages. Why are we interested in this? Because these, these genes are, can, can point us to either protective or vulnerable factors uh, in the brain uh, that we can then later on pinpoint and target, for instance. Um, all this work that I will explain today is uh, uh, from a former PhD student in the lab, Arlen Keu, who's now a postdoc at the Erasmus Medical Center. Um, so for this, we make use of the Allen Human Brain Atlas. Uh, so briefly to explain what that is, it's a genome-wide atlas based on microarrays largely. There are some RNA sec samples, but it's largely microarrays um, for which we can detect the expression of around 20,000 genes. Um, it's gathered from six adult uh, brains. These are post-mortem brains, um, health neurotypical. So there are no pathologies, no history of previous um, brain diseases. Um, uh, largely males uh, and one female, um, um, and, and, and it's mainly mid-range mid, mid, uh, mid, uh, in, in age. Um, there is a large number of samples collected from these six brains, so, so um, 3,700 samples are being collected, and they vary in number between the different donors. Um, and the nice thing about this atlas is that for each sample, they record the MNI coordinates, so these are um, um, imaging coordinates, so if they, they actually did MRI on the brains before they dissected them, and for each individual sample, we know exactly where it came from uh, in the brain. And it's also accompanied by a very uh, nice anatomical atlas, so uh, in general, so here you, ha you have annotations of different parts of the cortex and so on. Um, so what we did is that we started by defining these uh, BRAC stage related regions, right? So as I said, the, the, the pathology starts in, in, in the brain stem. So this is R1, then it moves to R2, R3, R4, and then 5 and 6. Um, and we basically associated every sample uh, in the human, uh, in the uh, Allen brain atlas to one of these. Of course, there are some samples that fall outside, so those we ignored, uh, but all of those that uh, overlap with regions that uh, uh, belong to these BRAC stages, we give them this annotation. And here you see the number of samples in each of these uh, um, uh, BRAC stage related regions. Um, so what we did is that we tried to define these BRAC stage related genes. Um, and there are two criteria that we employed here. So the first one is correlation. So as I explained, we are looking for genes that are either gradually decreasing or increasing in expression across these regions. So they have sort of a spatial pattern with high expression in the stem, low expression in the cortex, or the other way around. Um, and to make sure that we are looking at genes that have a, a sort of a larger effect, uh, as in this, the, the steepness of this curve is, is, is high enough, we also add an additional criteria that the genes have to have a, a, a strong enough differential expression between region one and six, yeah, either uh, uh, up or down. 
So if we do this, we uh, end up with identifying close to uh, 900 uh, uh, genes. Um, the, the, the large majority of them are uh, upregulated, so they, they show this pattern of expression. So they have higher expression in uh, region 6 compared to 1, uh, and about 350 genes that show the opposite uh, pattern. Um, to, to show you how these genes look like, so this is again a plot where here you see the, num the, the different regions from R R1 to 6. And this is an average of all the genes for which we have a correlation below zero. So they are decreasing in expression um, uh, as we go to, re uh, to, to regions affected later in the disease. Uh, and the different boxes here are for the different donors. So as I mentioned, we have six uh, healthy donors in this atlas. Uh, and you see that the patterns largely uh, agree between the different donors. Uh, and this goes for the uh, 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 negatively correlated genes and the positively correlated genes. But of course, um, as, as nice as this data is, uh, it is limited to six donors, of course. And then you can definitely question whether this pattern uh, is, is something general or is this an, yeah, uh, something restricted to the data that, we, uh, that we're looking at uh, here. Um, so what we did is that we uh, looked at uh, uh, two larger data sets, so GTEx uh, and, and, and the UK uh, uh, brain expression uh, uh, data. Um, and, and these include many, many more donors. So in this case, 134, and, and here's 751. Um, and we plotted the expression of those 900 genes that we detected, uh, split it by negatively correlated, positively correlated. Um, of course, this data is much larger, but it has another limitation, as in we don't, it doesn't cover all the regions. So what you see here is that we're only covering region 1, 3, 5, and 6, and then the GTEx data starting from R3 to R6. Nevertheless, we do see the same pattern. So for those 350 genes for which we identify as having negative correlation with the BRAC stages, you see the same pattern. So it's lower in 5 and 6 compared to uh, 1 and 3. Um, and, and the opposite here for those for which we identify the positive correlation. Uh, and the same picture in the GTEx data. So we're quite confident actually about the patterns that we detect in, in for these genes. Next, we asked the question um, of how does this look actually in the PD brain? Because we identified these genes in, in healthy donors, uh, keep that in mind. The only thing is that we looked at their expression pattern across regions that are affected in PD, but the samples are taken from healthy donors who have never been diagnosed with PD before. Um, and also there's no signs of um, tau pathologies in their brains. So we looked at a data set for which, again, we have uh, only uh, a subset of uh, regions, so not, not all the six uh, VRAC stages. And what you see here is that, again, in the control samples, uh, those, the expression of these genes, uh, again, mimic what we predicted, right? So we know that we, we, we measure, we, we identify these genes because they have a negative correlation with BRAC stages, and that's, again, what we see here. Uh, and, and the, the, same, the, the uh, opposite for the positively correlated genes. Now, um, we looked in uh, Parkinson's disease patients, and what you see here is that the, this, this correlation pattern is largely disrupted, right? We, we miss this pattern of uh, increasing expression of these genes, and we miss a pattern of decreasing expression of these genes. So in, something is wrong about these genes. Although we only identify them in healthy donors, they seem to behave differently in the Parkinson's disease uh, uh, brain. Okay, so um, moving forward, the next question we asked is, um, there are a lot, as I started, there are a lot of genes for which we um, know uh, there are variants associated with Parkinson's disease, meaning that if you compare a Parkinson's disease cohort to healthy controls, you see variants uh, in these genes um, um, that, are, uh, that are associated with PD. Um, so we asked the question whether any of these genes harboring the variants are actually part of our list of BRAC-related uh, uh, genes. Uh, and what you see here is that two of these genes actually um, uh, are among the list of negatively correlated genes in our case. Uh, and four of these uh, genes harboring variants are among the list of positively correlated uh, genes in our case. Um, so this, this is quite interesting. It also gives us ideas about uh, how these genes might actually be involved in the, uh, in, in the disease uh, uh, processes. Um, okay, so this is just a summary figure of our results. So these are 
kind of the key genes that we uh, uh, identified, and, and I skipped this part, but the dashed line here is about a module. So similar to the, all the analysis I described now, we can do this for a module or a group of genes instead of focusing on an individual gene. So we can group genes based on their expression profile and then check whether the, the average of this expression profile increases or decreases with the back stages. Um, the, the, the key message of the paper at the end is that we, we basically have um, uh, uh, information pointing to the dopaminergic system because, well, that, that's not really a surprise. It's one of the hallmarks of the disease. Um, but we can now dissect it basically into these different factors and how they relate to the different stages of, of disease progression. Okay, I, I hope this is uh, clear so far. Um, so. One one concern that uh, you should you should have had when I when I when I um, tell you this story is that we try to look for these genes that differ between region six and region one. Okay, um, the, these regions of on the of the brain are, are largely different in terms of their cellular composition. Right, so region six is in the cortex; it's very neuron rich. While if we talk about region one, this is mainly in the brain stem, so you will get more glia than neurons, basically. So it can be that the differences that we are detecting are largely reflecting this difference in, in cellular composition. There are ways to check this computationally, as in we try to deconvolute the RNA sequencing signal that we see based on the different uh, cell types that we assume underlie the, the data. Uh, and if we do that, I, I will not explain the details, but the, the significant p-value here basically tells you that for this gene that in which we identified uh, as an interesting gene, a BRAC-related uh, gene in our case, the signal is independent of the neuronal uh, content of the samples. So even if we correct for the difference in neuronal composition of these different of these brain regions, we still find this gene correlated um, um, with the BRAC stage. Right. So using computational analysis, this gives us an idea that, OK, our results are probably uh, valid and robust to these differences. Um, but of course, this is not the, uh, the ultimate choice. Right. So we, we rely on these bulk genomics. Uh, and in this case, it's just a mixture of all the cell types that we encounter in the tissue. It will be more ideal if we actually use single cell genomics or single cell data to profile the expression profile of each individual cell type, right? Um, this will give us a much clearer picture because then we can uh, say for sure that uh, th these patterns that we detect are dependent or not dependent on uh, specific cell uh, populations. Um, I will not go into the details of this, but most of these single cell genomics approaches to measure RNA in single cells are based on dissociations. So basically you take the tissue, you use, uh, uh, dissociate the, the cell, so every cell is now independent, and then you sequence it. Um, you lose a lot of useful information in this case because cells at the end in the tissue, they don't act independently. They act in, 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 in uh, consortium with other cells uh, around them. And they, um, so, so with spatial transcriptomic techniques, you actually can measure this. So, um, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip this. So that's a bit what changed in, in my lab in the last couple of years is that instead of relying only on these uh, transcriptomic atlases, we now uh, rely a lot on single cell data um, to do kind of similar work as I explained now. Um, but the single cell data also comes with newer challenges in terms of analysis, right? And that is what we focus on now in the lab in, as in building tools and methods for the analysis of single cell and spatial transcriptomic data. So today I want to show you one of these um, tools and methods that we uh, have developed uh, recently. Um, so as I mentioned, for single cell RNA sequencing, this is really a very valuable tool and it allows us to basically chart the, the uh, cellular map of a tissue, right? We, we take a piece of tissue, we dissociate it, we uh, 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 label the cells and then we measure the RNA expression. Um, and, and based on that, we have built these massive atlases of, of the cellular composition across different parts of the brain in mouse and human and so on. The major problem of this, as I mentioned, is that you completely lose the spatial information. So we have no idea whether this cell uh, type over here interacts with this cell type over here. This information is just totally lost in, in the data. On the other hand, spatial transcriptomic methods allows you to basically measure the RNA expression 
of the tissue uh, as it is, right? So here, this is a section of the uh, somatosensory motor cortex in the mouse. Um, and, and it's such a beautiful picture. You can basically see the different cell types, where they are, the different layers of the cortex and so on. Um, again, this is not for free. So the main limitation is that most of these methods are not transcriptome wide. So we cannot measure all the genes. So the example I'm showing here is for a method called OSM fish, OSM fish. Uh, it's based on single molecule fish. Um, and you do rounds of, of staining of three probes at a time. So I'm, I'm not sure this specific data set had 39 probes, if I'm not mistaken. I think they can go up to 100 now. Uh, but you're still limited in the number of genes uh, or transcript that you can, you can measure at, at, at one time. So it will be much nicer and better if we can actually integrate this data. So from the single cell data, we get the transcriptome wide view, as in we can profile any gene that we are interested in. Um, and from the spatial data, we can get the spatial information uh, even for a limited set of genes. Uh, so what we thought and others have also had the same uh, idea is that maybe if we have the same tissue and then we combine both data types, we actually get a much, uh, enhanced or better pictures. Um, and the way to do this is that we will attempt or try to impute the spatial data. So we will try to predict or make a guess on what is the expression profile of the genes that we have not measured. Yeah. Um, I'll explain how we do this now. This is uh, uh, the work of Tamim Abdelal, who's a, a, a fellow Egyptian, but he's a PhD student in, in the lab who's, who's finishing up uh, now. Um, so the way we do this is that we basically, this is the, the single cell data. Um, we have M cells, right? So a certain number of cells um, for which we have measured the entire transcriptome, right? And I break it into two parts here. So genes up to K, because these K genes uh, can also be measured in the spatial data, let's assume, yeah? So if we assume this is our spatial data, it's a totally different number of uh, uh, different set of cells. They come from the same tissue, but they are different cells. Um, we have measured the K genes in them, uh, but we also have the XY location, right? Because it's the spatial data. So what we will do now is that we will take one cell from the spatial data, and we will look in the single cell data for the most similar cell. So assume it's this one, yeah? And we can do this by just measuring the distance or the correlation or the similarity of these profiles based on the K genes that are shared in between the two data sets. Once we identify this, the most similar cell over here, we can basically impute the expression profile of that spatial cell by copying the dotted part over here. Yeah. So what this gives us at the end is that for the N cells that we have measured in space, we have the, the blue part. So these are the K genes we have measured. Um, and we have the L genes that we imputed. Uh, I apologize, this, is, uh, this, this should be here. Uh, so then the expression profile of each spatial cell is now enhanced, right? So we have added this whole dotted part, which we have not measured. We just made a guess on how this should look like. Okay. Um, there is one problem with this. So this, this sounds, okay, good, straightforward. Uh, there is one problem with this is that these two data sets are measured differently, right? So total, total different techniques. They are the same, they can be the same specimen, they can be the same biological sample, but they are measured um, uh, differently with different uh, techniques. So what will happen now is that you will get what's called batch effects or technical differences, right? Um, and you can imagine this as the data living in, in different spaces, let's say. So these two cells are very, very similar. They are the same, let's say they are the same neuronal type, right? Um, they are taken from the same tissue. Um, but if we look at the expression profile, even of the K-measured genes, they might not look very similar um, just because of these technical va uh, variation um, or technical factors. Uh, so that is something that we need to correct for. Um, so I will not explain the details, but we, this is called a, a yeah, domain adaptation. So you try to align two data sets. Um, the, the very basic idea here is that for, this, for each of the data sets, the single cell and the spatial data, you calculate the principal components. So you identify the major sources of variation in your data, and then you try to align these sources. So these are vectors and it's just a vector alignment uh, process. And there is a very straightforward uh, uh, way to do this, uh, which we borrowed from this uh, publication from the lab. Um, I'm, I'm happy to explain this in details if people are interested, by the way. 
but at the end of this, we basically align the data so they end up living in the same space. And then we can do what I explained in the previous uh, slide by taking one cell and then looking for the most similar cells and so on. Okay, so now does this work or not? So uh, I'm going to show you a few examples. So in this case, we take data from the primary visual cortex. Um, the spatial data is measured with a protocol called star map. Uh, in this case, they measured 1,500 cells um, and close to 1,000 genes. Um, and from a totally different study, um, they also profiled the primary visual cortex using single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, and in this case, they profiled close to 15,000 cells and uh, as I mentioned, you, you, you basically get all the transcripts in the, in the, in, in, in the genome. Um, so what I'm going to do now, um, I'm showing you five examples of these genes, right? So, so this is the, the cortex uh, in, in that direction. So uh, these, the, the, the layers are, uh, are, are, are layered like this. Um, uh, and these are examples of genes that have an interesting pattern, as in they are uh, expressed in specific layers. Uh, and these are the measurements that we get from the star map uh, data. So what we do now is that we, uh, we, we, we uh, throw away the measurement of COX-2, and then we assume that we have not measured COX-2. We try to impute it using the method I just explained, which is called SPAGE, by the way. Um, and then we compare the predicted to the measured uh, profile. If we do that for the <coughs> five, <coughs> sorry, for the five genes I'm showing here, you, you can appreciate that the predicted profile looks very, very similar to the measured profile. As in, uh, in, in general, we predict the location of the expression very, very well. Uh, in particular, I'm adding the, the lower example here of, of a gene called BSG. I actually don't know this gene. It does seem to be a marker of, uh, of blood vessels because you see here uh, uh, expression of this line. And, and you see that the imputed expression of the gene is, is very, very accurate in this case. Uh, of course, th this tells you that the method work, right? uh, works, right? So we, we, we can actually make these predictions with relatively good accuracy. Um, the interesting part is to actually predict genes that we have never measured in the star map data. So here I have two examples of genes that uh, were not measured in the star map data. Um, you can see that the pattern of expression looks quite interesting, right? So they are restricted to specific layers in the cortex. Um, so the question is, how do we validate this? So we go back to the Allen Atlas, actually, that I started with, because there we have the measurement of every single gene uh, across the entire mouse brain, right? So if we do that, uh, here is a zoomed version on the expression of uh, TSC, uh, TSC and uh, PVRL3. And you see that the expression with in situ hybridization from the mouse atlas matches our prediction of the expression in the star map data. So this gives us confidence that these page predictions that we make are actually valid. Um, even more interesting, here I'm showing you three genes, including RORB, so then you, you, you might know this one. Um, you see that the expression pattern measured with star map is not very great, right? So we know that RORB would be expressed uh, in this layer, but you, 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 you don't see it much in the star map data. And this has to do with the sensitivity of the protocols. On the other hand, if we look our, at our own predictions, they look quite good, by the way. Uh, so what we did is that we looked at another spatial data measured with awesome fish. They are not the same, they are both from the cortex, but not exactly the same region. So these are from the primary visual cortex. This is from the somatosensory cortex. Nevertheless, the, the patterns of expression of these genes uh, is, is, is pretty much the same. And what you see here is that the, the measurement of RORB with awesome fish aligns with our prediction in the star map data, much better than the star map data itself. Right? So it seems that enhancing the spatial data with the single cell data uh, adds very, very valuable information, uh, even for the measured genes. Yeah. Okay. Um, of course, I showed you examples. So just to uh, quickly show you that we are not cherry picking, uh, we compared SPAGE to three other methods that basically do the exact same task. Um, uh, and we, we, we assess this based on the correlation between the uh, uh, predicted and the measured uh, image. Um, and while these correlations are not super high in general for all, all the methods, uh, I, I hope you appreciate that the, the, the pattern that you see is actually quite good. Uh, so so I'm, I'm arguing here that this correlation is a, an okayish measure, but it's not the perfect measure. Um, and we do slightly better than the others, um, uh, but pretty much the same uh, performance. Um, 
So I'm, I'm going to show you, show you another data set. Um, um, so here we have data from the hypothalamus uh, measured in space with MIRFISH uh, for a very large number of cells, only 455 genes. Um, and from the exact same study, there was a matching single cell arginesic data from the same tissue. Um, so we integrated this data and I'm, I will not show you examples of specific genes, uh, but again, just our overall performance seems to be uh, slightly better than the others. Um, but the important bit is that in terms of computation, our method is a lot faster and requires much, much less memory uh, to run. So you see this here, uh, basically all the, the black dots are our methods page. Um, and on the y-axis, this is how much memory the method uses. On the x-axis, how much time it takes. And you see that we're consistently doing better than others in, in terms of uh, efficiency. Um, so that, that's why I'm showing this data set because as data sets become bigger and that's certainly happening now, um, uh, methods that perform in this corner of the plot will be much better um, suited. Um, <clears throat> so th this is actually the end of my, uh, uh, of my presentation. So just some take home messages is that in general, we take this functional genomic approach to try to understand the role of genetic variants uh, in brain disease or brain function in general. Um, I show you, you this example based on the uh, Allen Human Brain Atlas, where we try to identify genes and pathways that are correlated or associated with this uh, progression uh, pattern of Parkinson's disease. Um, and moving into the single cell and spatial transcriptomics field, uh, there are so many technical challenges and methodological challenges. So we, here I showed you an example of SPAGE, a method we developed to try to tackle this challenge of how do we integrate spatial and, 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 and single cell uh, data. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And these are the people in, in the lab. The work I showed you today is for Arlen, who had actually left us at the time of this picture. And the SPAGE method is the work of Tamim. Um, and we actually do have a, an opening for a PhD position in the lab. So if you know someone who would be interested or would like this type of work, uh, please let them know. And thank you. So thank you again for this uh, great presentation. Uh, I learned a lot. So this is a completely new field for me. And uh, I guess uh, many in the audience might feel like myself. Um, we don't have any question for now, but I have a lot of questions and we still have quite a bit of time. So I would actually suggest that we use the time to maybe clarify some of the some part of the talk that might be highly complicated maybe to to explain uh, you presented at the beginning of the talk a kind of map where you were talking about um trying to round between this special temporal pattern and an interactive visualization and how this fit into data integration basically in the field of transcriptomic I, do you recall yeah. which yeah. Uh, slide I'm yeah. talking about? And I guess this is probably the beginning of the story for, for young neuroscientists trying to understand how he can actually use uh, the data that are coming from an atlas, for example, to actually answer real as a real yeah. questions in the field of neuroscience. So will you come back to that yeah. maybe? Yeah, so, so maybe helpful. I can I can say something about this. Um, exactly. So, yeah. So indeed. So so these atlases are very valuable on on their own. As I mentioned, this example, for instance. So the picture I'm showing here is something that we actually just pulled off the data for the mm -hmm. expression of a gene called Duchenne muscular dystrophy (DMD). Um, th this is a gene that is involved in in DMD, the disease. It's a muscular disease, uh, but one third of the patients actually have uh, cognitive problems. And there's very high instance of ASD and the ADHD uh, in these patients. Um, so we, we wondered actually, what is the gene doing in the brain? We know what the gene is doing in the muscle very well. Um, um, what this trophin does in the muscle, we don't know what the gene does in the brain. Uh, so one thing we immediately did here is that you just create this map of where is that gene expressed in the brain? And you immediately see, for instance, the hippocampus and the amygdala popping up, which mm -hmm. imme immediately relates to the uh, uh, phenotype that we see in these patients. Um, we answered questions such as, for instance, you, you can also uh, check the expression of different uh, isoforms in the data, different splice variants. Um, and 
we know that the mutations in the patients target different isoforms of the gene. So you can also look at this discrepancy in the expression of the different isoforms. Um, you have mouse and human, so you can immediately compare genes that you are studying in mouse for a specific mouse model, uh, whether they are actually expressed in the same location in the brain or not. And now more recently with the uh, single cell data, mm -hmm. because the Allen Institute also generates a lot of these, um, you, can, you can compare again, is the gene expressed actually in the same cell type uh, between mouse and human or not? Because as, as it, it will come as a surprise to many people, but a lot of the very well studied genes are actually expressed in either different regions in the brain, but different cell types or different stages of development. Um, yeah, the species are very well conserved, but yeah, it, it's not a perfect uh, conservation. Yes. So I, I think this, this initial ex exploration of mm -hmm. where is that gene expressed is, is a very good question. Um, and I would also argue that looking at these, not, not immediately networks, but even uh, again, without any um, uh, method development on, on, uh, on your side, you can just use these web tools to look which other, other genes look similar to my gene of interest. Um, and, and this is always very uh, yeah, informative, as in if you're looking at a specific transcription factor, the most correlated genes are very likely to be targets of this transcription factor. Uh, so if you're trying to predict new targets or to assess whether a gene you're interested in is a target or not, this is a very straightforward way to, uh, to look at it. Well, thank you for your answer. Uh, I'm really happy because it does clarify uh, something that I didn't understood. And you mentioned this regional vulner uh, vulnerability uh, in relation uh, to single cell. I will come to that. But we have a question from the audience also asking you, uh, do you find specific uh, in situ hybridization techniques being more reliable at predicting the gene expression once you merge it with uh, single cell DNS sequencing data? Mm. Um, so, yeah, so, so, yeah, for so that, that's for the spatial data uh, for the second part, I, I guess. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. So, um, um, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 this is all published, by the way, so the, the, that's in the paper. So I showed you now uh, OSIMFISH, uh, I showed you STARMAP, and I showed you MERFISH. These are the three methods I mentioned now for spatial uh, transcriptomics. Yeah. And they do differ uh, greatly in the, in the, in the uh, molecular technique they use. So OSIMFISH is based on uh, hybridization, uh, as I mentioned. Um, STARMAP is in situ sequencing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, and Merfish, um, I think Merfish is based on barcoding. Uh, so so they, they they differ greatly. So without going into too much into the details, they differ in their sensitivity. So how likely are you to pick an RNA actually if it's expressed? Uh, in that sense, OSIMFISH is very very sensitive compared to the others. Um, they differ in the number of genes they measure. So for OSIMFISH, we only had a data set with an overlap of. 39 genes, um, and they differ in the resolution that they can uh, detect. Uh, we do see differences in, in, in the performance with the integration, um, as in the number of overlapping genes matters, right? So if we have more genes that overlap between spatial and single cell data, then we can make bet better predictions because we are more sure about these distances that we calculate. So if we take one cell from space, and we try to look for the most similar cell in the single cell data, the longer the vector, the, the larger the number of genes, the more reliable these distances are calculated. On the other hand, the OSIMFISH data has less genes, but the measurements are very accurate. So it, it is a bit uh, difficult to say that one is better than the other because they, yeah, you, in, on one hand, you can gain more genes, but you lose in sensitivity or you can use less genes, and then, but then the sensitivity is lower. Uh, mm -hmm. Shorter answer is we can do the the predictions for any of these. Any of these. So it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Uh, there are differences, but at the end you can make these predictions. Wow. Okay. So Ofure Oko is asking. Uh, he's saying thank you for he or her actually saying thanks for your talk. 
Please, how adequate are the use of such atlases like the islands for the provision of data required for comparative anatomical analysis between humans and other species? So he's asking this for studies involving translational precision medicine, for example. Mm. So how good can, can we predict uh, uh, data using the Allen's Atlas as a source? Yeah, so um, you, you should keep in mind that these atlases are, are in general uh, generated from uh, healthy individuals, right? Um, whether that being in, 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 a, in a mouse model or in mm -hmm. um, So there are limitations to how far you can go with this. Uh, what, what we argue is that the, these patterns of expression are in general very consistent, by the way, across humans. So even these six individuals that we have here, they are very consistent in terms of which genes are expressed and so on. Um, but they, yeah, they, they, they don't have a, any uh, uh, phenotype, right? They don't have a, something that you can associate with the uh, expression patterns. So it's, it, it all depends on what you do. Like the example we did here is that we try to order the brain regions based on progression of pathology. And then we can find something that we think is interesting. Ultimately, we had to go to a, a diseased uh, group to, to see whether these genes are indeed relevant or not. Um, but I think the question was also about comparing- uh, 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 With other species also. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what to say about this. So, so the atlases give again give you the healthy profile, which you can compare across the different uh, species. So it gives you a bit of a baseline, as in that is what we know in general about these differences. So uh, either be careful or or, uh, or or be encouraged to use this mouse model for for this specific disease that you're studying. But it doesn't tell you anything about. The behavior uh, or the um, yeah phenotypes that that's a bit difficult. We we're only looking at RNA in this case. Well, we have another question. Thank you for your answer. And um, I'm trying to depict the question because it's truncated. Uh, what are the proteins or pathways that that are regulated? I guess by the genes that lost their pattern of expression. Is that is there an example? of uh, uptake of aggregate protein inside neurons, or how do you explain that with uh, the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease? Yeah, so I, I did not go into um, uh, the details of this. Mm -hmm. um, but you, 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 what, what we saw is basically that, that the um, groups of genes that are correlated with this pattern that is going down, that they are in, in general related to, uh, immune, uh, uh, to the immune system. system. Right? So they are expressed in, in, in uh, microglia, for instance. That's what we, we see. So that, that's how far I can, um, uh, I can speculate about these without uh, actually uh, validating them. But they are related to the, to the immune system. Um, I, I maybe I should add one more thing about the accumulation of um, because that's a bit of a controversial thing with these uh, results Frank, as well. Uh, uh, that was my next question actually because uh, the correlation between uh, the BRAC stage and the clinical severity in Parkinson's disease yes. is still controversial, yes. right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. so that's, uh, that's the idea that everything is coming from the brainstem before getting to uh, the substantia nigra is still. Yeah. Controversial, well, yeah. Yeah, so so I, I we do recognize this, huh? So uh, mm -hmm. uh, we were fully fully aware of this, um, and I should say that we we limit our uh, observations to the BRAC stages, to only to the pathology, right? So mm -hmm. I, I I tried not to make any link to to the uh, clinical symptoms. That's really mm -hmm. we don't know, right? So all we're saying is that you see this staging in the uh, uh, neuropathology, what might underlie this, right? Um, uh, so, so that is the uh, yeah that that's a bit the, the limitation, but I, it, it it is more on a limitation on on using this neuropathology to describe the disease as well. That yeah that, that's a difficult situation. In relation to that, one thing we find here is that if you notice, SNCA is actually one of the uh, genes that we find associated with this pattern, right? Mm -hmm. That has lower expression uh, early on, higher expression later, um, and that's consistent across all the data sets that we have looked at. Um, either healthy, uh, um, in all the healthy data sets that we looked at. 
And, and that's a bit opposite to what people see, right? Because if you look at the PD brain, you always see more uh, tangles in, in exactly. region one. The problem with that is that you, you look at post-mortem brain, right? So someone has died yeah. at a certain stage. So region one has had a long time to actually accumulate these tangles um, and region four or five at the moment in which the, 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 the person died actually did not have that much time to accumulate the, uh, the um, uh, tangles. It, it, so it, 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 your quantification of the alpha-synuclein protein will always be higher in the earlier uh, regions because of this time axis. Um, so that's a, that's a very complicating factor. We also know that mutations in SNCA are gain of function mutations. So people who have the mutation actually express more SNCA. Um, so, so this does not align easily with the fact that we see lower expression in, in the early time points. Um, this might be different in patients. I believe so. That's also what, uh, what, what, uh, what we, uh, I'm trying to switch my slides again. That's not working. Yeah, that's also yeah. what we saw in the in the patient uh, data. That again, this pattern is not fully conserved uh, between the controls and the PD, so that's, mm -hmm. it's totally disrupted. So it can very well be that um, that this pattern uh, for SNCA looks quite different in in the patients in general. But yeah, all very good points. Uh, I, I wish we could answer more of these. <laughs> well, thank you for for this great answer. Um, so during your talk, actually, you mentioned a switch that you did in your methodological approach, switching from the transcriptomics analysis to single cell data. And you actually mentioned a limitation, uh, saying that by doing that, you lose also some kind of special information. So I guess my question is how critical is the, the loss of this information actually uh, into better understanding uh, the behavior of those genes that you're looking at? And uh, how can you get around that? Is there a way to, like technically, I would say, like really yeah. out of curiosity, how do you get around this technical limitation? Yeah. Um, first, on the importance of this information, it highly depends, right? So if you're just trying to create a, a, an atlas of the cell types that exist in a certain tissue, you might not care about the spatial organization. Um, so, but, but in other situations, if you're, I don't know, if you're looking at uh, 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 cancer samples or, or you want to figure out how uh, uh, microglia interact with neurons, for instance, you, you will be very much interested in these spatial patterns. So I think it's a bit of a, uh, yeah, it really depends on the question that you ask. So it, it's not that you always need the spatial patterns, uh, but they are always, they, they, but they are valuable. Uh, how do we come across this? So a big part of this is technical development. So keep in mind that this, these fields are moving really fast. Uh, mm -hmm. The first single cell method was published 10 years ago uh, when people sequenced one cell. Now we look at papers where they sequence 4 million cells in, in one go. Um, so, so the field is really moving a bit too fast. So I think technology will eventually help, as in we will be able to do spatial um, transcriptomics on a regular basis with high resolution and high accuracy. Until that happens, um, methods like I explained uh, today on, on measuring different data types that are perhaps giving you different views of the same cell uh, are probably going to, to stay for a while. And not only spatial and RNA, by the way, because we can also do single cell ataxic, for instance, to measure genome accessibility or uh, methylation profiles or whatever. And, at the moment, it's not possible to do all these measurements in one go. Uh, that's a bit difficult still, might change. Uh, so yeah, data integration, I think, is, is, is going to be a, a key point. Oh, thank you for your answer. So I guess I have three uh, questions that we always ask our guests. And I, I guess I have three and a half. <laughs> so my half question is, uh, what is your vision uh, of the well, the development of this field for the future of neuroscience. How do you see uh, this field in the next year and which kind of breakthrough this field might actually bring on the bench in this uh, in neuroscience? So this is my half question, right? And then we still have three minutes mm -hmm. <laughs> left. <laughs> um. It's a bit difficult to say because I know yeah. that people are interested in a very wide range of, 
uh, of questions. Um, but perhaps uh, I think, for instance, um, cross species comparisons are going to be very important. Um, so again, uh, yeah, yeah, people might have seen these studies that, that point to the fact that, for instance, serotonin receptors are just expressed in different cells between mouse and human. So what are we doing uh, actually using mouse models in this case? So I, I think this is going to be an important aspect of it. So how do cell types differ between uh, different species? And are the, the models we're using actually valid for the human conditions or not? I think this is one of the big questions that I'm interested in, but I think lots of people would also find this uh, quite relevant. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, think, great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I start with my three questions. So most of the participants in these webinars, they're, they're usually really evolving in highly limited environment where they might not have access to all these computational approaches, this high sophisticated technology. So I guess my first question is, uh, how do we actually export this from, from Europe, from where you are in the Netherlands, to Africa, to low middle income uh, uh, laboratories, where people are really also yeah. eager to try things. So. Yeah. Yeah, so I think big part of this is on us people who develop methods to make things a bit uh, simpler and easier to use, actually. Um, mm -hmm. And and so I, I hope I showed you this example with this page method that we try to make it yeah. fast and use less memory. So you can actually run things uh, uh, yeah, locally or on your uh, uh, computer or laptop without requiring a high performance computer. Uh, but that has limitations. So not everything can be done like this, right? So there are a lot of things that for, for which we still need high performance computing. Um, I, I really don't have an answer here, uh, except that there are many uh, situations where you can make use of uh, open source uh, um, uh, resources like the uh, Google Collab, for instance, allows you to run uh, code on a high performance computing that you don't need to own or, or you don't need to worry about where this runs. Um, so resources and, and tools like these are very, very valuable for people who want to try more computations. Um, and, and maybe I should also mention one more thing. In terms of data availability, it used to be that uh, everyone closes on their data and, 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 and you cannot actually use it. Um, this is changing quite a bit. So mm -hmm. again, all the resources I use for my PhD, I mean, this is all public data on, on, on repositories online, right? So I actually, I think I did. We, we did only a very uh, small qPCR experiment in my whole uh, PhD. Um, so th th there is a lot of publicly available data. The single cell field is particularly very open. So most mm -hmm. of the data is publicly available even before the publications uh, are out. On preprints so, repository, for example? It, or... Exactly, yeah. So the preprint for the publication itself, but also data uh, made available before yeah. the paper is out uh, is, is very common now. And I mm -hmm. really encourage people to make use of this. Mm -hmm. There is a lot that you can do with what people have measured already before you actually end up measuring something yourself, right? Not, not saying that experimental uh, uh, experiments are, are, not, are not useful at all. That's totally not what I'm saying. Um, I'm just saying that by looking at what's published, what's publicly available, what people have done before can actually better guide you to a much uh, stronger edge in your own experiments compared to what has been done before. Oh, that's great. So I guess we get to my second question. And my second question is really like uh, reflecting on your own uh, part uh, as a scientist, uh, what actually helped you to actually be so motivated, so enthusiastic about uh, your research? Um. Yeah, that's, that's a difficult one. I, 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 so first of all, I think I've been uh, very lucky in, 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 in a lot of uh, situations as in uh, ending up in the, in the right place and, and the right time. Um, but, but certainly my mentors were, were very, very helpful. Um, I didn't know them before starting my PhD. Uh, I kind of made the choice to choose a mentor that is kind of nice, you know, as in uh, I know how to email with, with, with him or her. Um, in, a, in an easy way, can communicate in an easy way. And I think that paid off very, very well because throughout the process, you actually pass by very, very difficult times always. Huh? It has nothing to do with anyone. Every trajectory has ups and downs. Um, and if you actually have a good relation with, with your mentor, it's much, much easier to get through the difficult times than it would be if, if your mentor is far away that you cannot actually talk to uh, him or her. Um, so I think 
yeah, choosing the mentor is not, not by someone being in a big lab or publishing uh, super high or just by being a nice person, I think uh, paid off very well for me at least uh, in, in my research. Ah, that's great. You, you actually partly answered my last question, which was a uh, mentorship advice for the young neuroscientist, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, certainly. I, I cannot yeah. emphasize this more. I mean, uh, I still mm -hmm. have a very good relation with my supervisors. Um, they they mm -hmm. still support me actually quite a lot. Uh, we still work together. Um, yeah, I, I really cannot emphasize this uh, strong enough. Yeah. yeah, well, that was it. Uh, really, thank you for your generosity, for your time. Thank you for being here with us today. And um, yeah, if we have additional questions coming in the stream, we'll probably forward the, the questions yeah. to you. No, yeah. so thank you very much for the very generous invite. I, I truly enjoyed <laughs> this. And uh, yeah, feel free to, to reach me out, uh, to, to reach out if uh, there are any additional questions or if someone wants to discuss further. I'll be more than happy to do that. Well, we surely do. <laughs> thank you so much again. Thanks a lot. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>